This is uh, not the plan itself in this talk, uh, but an introduction to the plan. The first thing to say about it is why has the National Trust, which is a heritage organization, produced a document about planning for the future? The reason is that from about 2010, <coughs> the National Trust began to notice planners encroaching on areas and making new plans that threatened the irreplaceable heritage that it is the purpose of this organization to defend. The Cultural Heritage Advisory Committee of the National Trust was my sounding board during the formulation of this plan. So we started writing this in 2018 together. Um, I'm the author, so it's, it's not a document produced by a committee, but it's a document that comes out of a committee. And I thank all the committee members, most of whom are here today, for their input over that time. We don't all agree on every point, but it was uh, great to have that collection of expertise, which is really formidable, on hand during the devising of this, this plan. Second thing to say is that it's not a plan that a traditional land use planner would um, produce if asked or employed to produce a plan. It doesn't talk about plot ratios or sizes of blocks or um, different kinds of land uses. It tries to recapture the best ideas of um, a vision for the future that have been put forward since Colonel Light set up his surveyor's equipment on the banks of the Torrens back in 1836. So, and this mostly says what Deborah said already. <laughs> there has been an increasing, and you see it in the papers and you see it in the online forums, you see it in In Daily, just increasing disillusion with the uh, planning process. We got very poor implementation, as uh, Warren Jones has shown us, uh, of the um, State Planning Commission. We got very poor implementation of its new guidelines, uh, and we watched with concern as community participation in planning declined and declined. So we, we now got a, a system where at the uh, SCAP level, the, the de development of approval for major projects, 90, more than 98% are waived through on the first submission, which is almost to say, you can do what you like. Um, <clears throat> when you have a 98 success rate, who needs planners? And it's maybe not surprising that if you look up the Master of Planning degree at the University of Adelaide, it looks really good until you get down to the fine print, which says the program's currently unavailable. Um, <clears throat> you don't need to study planning if planning is irrelevant to what happens. 50 years ago, South Australia was a recognized leader in planning in Australia, and now it's not. If you read the so-called 30-year plans that have produced 2010, 11, and it's updated in 2016. The documents follow pretty pictures, but not challenging ideas. It's very focused on the short-term political agendas of the day. So what happened to the vision that from time to time South Australians have had? The National Trust Plan starts by acknowledging the facts that we can't get around. Our geography, our topography, our climate, our historical patterns of development, our demographic um, expansion over the years. This uh, document aims not to be politically or ideologically driven. It, I hope, might inspire people with a radical idea of the future and it might hearten people whose approach is conservative. It's certainly not party political. It doesn't pretend to be original. It builds on good ideas from the years past that were never properly implemented. And it focuses on concrete goals that, that can be easily understood and measured. So if you 
communities and the state adopted this. He said, five years from now, we should have done this. Have we done it? Ten years ago, on to the future, we said we we're going to do this. Have we done it? Why not? Let's do it. It's nothing like the plans that you used to read in planning textbooks, many of which came from out of North America. Now, this is just one, a famous one from the, the 1920s, showing the, the typical shape of a city. Um, and it bears no relationship to what Adelaide has ever been like or is today. What is our city actually like? It's not like a circle. It looks like a radish <laughs> stretching from Selix Beach um, up to, to Gola, up to Gola and the Gola River. That's, that's the city we got, enclosed between the seas, which we know may, are rising, <laughs> and the hills, which have always been a potential fire danger to human beings and their activities. Here is Colonel Light's version of the, the radish produced for the South Australian Company in 1838. It took Light's initial surveys and overlaid them with a, a grid or semi-grid pattern of titles for sale. Um, the, the essence of the South Australian colonial experience was so very simple. You declare the country uninhabited, um, you put it up for sale, you plough the money from the, the sales into the government of the country, uh, and it, it all happens automatically. You, so you buy land for nothing, and you sell it for something. These features of the environment that Light put on his plan, the hills face, the sea coast, the swamps that were and became West Lakes, um, the water courses, not just the Torrens River and the Port River, but the, the uh, creeks that run into it and the rivers to the north and the south. These are permanent features which are going to be with us forever. Light's special contribution was something that the landscape didn't decree, and that was the idea of a city in a park. It's so famous I don't need to spend much time on it, but it's important to realize that his, the vision was not just a circle with a park around it. <laughs> it also conformed to the topography. It recognized that the Torrens was a river that could flood. It recognized that it was fed by creeks, which could pose problems. It recognized that the people should be located on the higher ground and not the lower. But it was so beautiful, it entered. From the time that there was a Garden City movement, Adelaide was the archetype of what an ideal city should be. <clears throat> the city in the park just stayed an inspiration. During the First World War, uh, Adelaide hired its first and for a long time only city planner, Charles Reed, um, <clears throat> who came inspired by Ebenezer Howard's Garden City movement and uh, put forward for the first time, I think, the idea of a second belt of parkland around the city. He drew his schematically in a circle, but it was a great idea. Uh, it wasn't implemented uh, because um, suburban development went too fast for it. And the state didn't adopt it. In fact, um, they more or less forced him into resignation. They had another great idea, and that was a Torrens Linear Park. That did come about. It just took 50 years uh, <clears throat> to do it. Now, in the 1980s, out of a planning department very different from that one, the one that we've known the last couple of decades, came an updated version of Charles Reed's idea. And this one, you get a second belt of parkland. Part of it is a pedestrian and cycle path along the coast, and a lot of that's been achieved. But in this 
1987 Mass Open Space Systems Study, which got a lot of publicity in the newspaper at the time and was hailed as the best thing since Colonel Light. You got more or less a national park running all the way from Selex Beach up to Gawler and then down the Gawler River to the sea. <clears throat> it was a, a stunning vision. It recognized topography and the fundamental and irrevocable facts of geography. Um, but it's only been partially implemented. Why is that? The seacoast was not so hard to do, <clears throat> though one little strip is still <laughs> partially is still delayed, but I'm, I'm sure it will come. Um, but how to fund the acquisition of the land uh, across the hill's face. That, that was the problem, but they had an ingenious solution. There's something called the, the development fund. So anytime a developer puts forward a development um, which doesn't allow enough green space to meet the requirements, they can pay into this fund. And the idea was the fund would fund the development of the linear parks and the hills face development as it went along. Um, when we were at the early stages of this, I wanted to find out from the planning department how the, uh, the outer uh, thing was going. Uh, I couldn't get them on the phone. All the lines directed me to other numbers. Um, and I decided to go physically to the planning department in Grenfell Street, but the Wilson security people wouldn't let me in. There, there's, there's no receptionist. I ended up at the planning, uh, the Minister for Planning's office in uh, Roman Mitchell House. They wouldn't let me in either, <clears throat> um, but they did promise that somebody would ring me. Uh, anyway, eventually I got a phone call and I put my question, I said, thank you. Thank you very much for, for telling me about this and get back to me when you can about what's happening with the, the mass open space study proposals. Uh, I never got the phone call. <laughs> so, uh, and what happened to the fund? Well, it's being used to fund the shortfall in the implementation of the, the State Planning Commission and, and that scheme. That's what it's being used for, believe it or not. But you can go beyond that. Go back, think about Light's map of the topography, and you can see that there's potential not just for one or two linear parks along watercourses, but many. Now, some of them, I've been out exploring on my bicycle. And get out, there's a, there's a Salisbury uh, one, there's a dry creek, a bit of a linear park there. There's places where individual councils have implemented this. So it's an idea that's been in the air, but there hasn't been the will to carry it through. So a good plan, this plan, <coughs> would, would say, okay, let's go to those watercourses. We've got 50 years. Let's get them all into shape for flood control, to cope with climate change, for the enjoyment of the people, and that, think of what they could do there. Enable anyone to start on the seacoast, walk to the city without crossing a road, and make their way in a variety of ways all the way into the Adelaide Hills and hit the Heisen Trail. Um, it's, it's a stunning and entirely achievable project. Now, we have the climate change problem. This plan doesn't plan for climate change. It accepts that it's coming and says, what? what, what how, are we gonna, how are we gonna cope? This is an article, very recent. It said, said my notice this September 28th in the New York Times. It's a picture of flooded uh, downtown Manhattan near Wall Street <coughs> with a man in a raincoat standing there on his mobile phone. And the author of this opinion piece points out, oh, if you looked at the map of Manhattan as it was in the 18th century, you found that where the creeks were and where the swamps were is where the floods came. And that's where they will come in a changing climate. So why was the 28th Street station on the New York subway flooded? It was flooded because um, 
There was a swamp there. It was built on a swamp. Now, these are protections by expert people, not me, not my committee, um, of the effect rising seas will have on the Adelaide metropolitan area. It's quite dramatic, really. The Port River and the surrounding lowlands really go very fast. You don't need much of a sea rise in order to see them cut back. So those wonderful industrial sites or post-industrial sites you can see, if you take the Port River cruise uh, one day, then they'll be underwater. Uh, the inlet from the Port River to the West Lakes area, that will all go underwater. <clears throat> as will areas around the airport. So our future shoreline from the port to Brighton would look like something like this. An interesting feature of this projection is that if you go looking for heritage buildings and heritage neighborhoods, the, the legacy of the 19th century, you will find that most of them will be unaffected by these projections. Most of them were lo well located in the first place. It was the failure to take account of geography in the rush to develop new suburbs that caused places to be flooded. But one area that will be of concern is the whole Lever Lefevre Peninsula <clears throat> from Semaphore right up to Outer Harbour. That's going to be such a narrow, if this happens, if we don't avert it, it's going to be such a narrow peninsula, it may be hard to defend. Plus that, we're told there may be more extreme weather events in the future. <clears throat> um, I read an article yesterday in uh, one of the papers about the storms we had last week, and they're related to developments in the Indian Ocean are occurring more frequently um, and which will produce more extreme weather events like that. What happens if one of them hits Adelaide? This was known long ago and it was known, known by Colonel Light. This is, I love this particular map. This is simply the projected highest flood level in a once in a century flood in the eastern suburbs of Adelaide. But if you see what happens around the eastern, around East Terrace in Adelaide, you understand, oh, okay. Oh, a pointer, good. Go along East Terrace. You can see why Colonel Light drew the jagged boundary the way he did. He could see where the water courses had been, as we nowadays mostly can't. Now, historians, I knew when I first arrived in Adelaide, there were still historians who were debating why this jagged thing was there, and maybe it was for defense against hostile natives or, or, or a, a possible rising of the, the new poor uh, working class. Uh, but no, it was the flood map that determined the shape. So this is why the protection and development of these watercourses becomes more than a, a nice thing to do to produce parks and walks. This is what happens if the Brown Hill and Keswick Creek system reasserts itself in one of those floods like they had in Manhattan last year. So a lot of the airport runway goes down underwater. <clears throat> It's threatened anyway by the rising seas. And you have all this area that was developed later in the uh, development of inner metropolitan Adelaide. It reasserts itself um, for a few days or a week or so as, as a flood zone. Now, future population. If you go to your library or dig up the plans that have been put forward in the last 30 years for Adelaide, future Adelaide, almost every one of them starts by saying, how are we going to cope 
with our greatly expanded population. Where are they going to go? Won't we have to push into farmland in order to accommodate these people? Won't we have to rezone news or threaten the hill's face? Uh, that would be too terrible. What we must do is allow for greater density. <clears throat> There's a, a very interesting um, commission study by Deloitte for Adelaide uh, talking about bigger Adelaide in 2016. And it says two things. One is we have to um, deregulate our planning processes to allow for higher densities because our population is going to grow by a million or so in the next 30 years. Um, and then there's another part of the Deloitte study that says, but it might not grow like that, and, and, but we're finished economically if we don't grow by that amount, so we still must provide for that, those higher densities. It's just a, a developer's charter, really. What has really been going on with Adelaide's population? This map shows it starts from 1950, so... The uh, key, oh, there it is, starting from 1950, so 1955, 2.98% growth there. And then you have two remarkable decades between 1960, 1975, you've got very high growth at over 4.6% per annum. Um, <clears throat> you follow it up, the closer you get to the present, you do, these are not spectacular growth rates. And there is no reason currently to believe that we are, can see in the next 30 or 40 years, a return to those decades, post-war decades, in which the metropolitan area population really took off. So, in looking at this, the, a plan for the next 50 years, um, my, my kid, committee and I um, said, well, you don't necessarily have to plan for high growth. It would be stupid not to say something about what happens, what do we do if the growth gets back to those post-war levels. But we should also be thinking about two other things. What if there's no growth at all? How should that affect our planning? Or what if the population actually shrinks? This is not a silly hypothesis. It, all over the developed world, Europe and the United States, there are examples of once Adelaide-sized cities which have shrunk to half their size or less. They've coped with this in various ways, and I don't have time to, to talk about that. But I do want to say something about what, what might we do if there's high growth, no growth, and shrinkage. And this is not to advocate any particular program or targets for density. It's really intended as an answer to those property interests uh, which tell us that um, we have to, to plan for high growth by allowing higher densities everywhere. So the recent plans for high growth coming out of the planning, government planning machine features growth along designated transport corridors. What's a transport corridor? Well, it's a very broad definition if you read the, the plans. It's, uh, it can be a road where the bus service is every 15 minutes or faster. Uh, so that's one definition, which is, and, and another definition is um, a tram or rail service, or a road of four lanes or more. So all of those qualify as transport corridors. <clears throat> So this is what they look like if you put them on the map, or like this. This is the southern ones, two of our silliest um, transport corridors. <clears throat>
uh, Omni Road and Duthie Street because there's a bus service down there. That, that, that's the justification for allowing medium and high-rise along those so-called transport corridors. <clears throat> but suppose you took it, the transport corridor idea seriously. You wouldn't look to develop along every bit of a, a transport corridor once you'd identified them. You'd want to do your development near a station. That's where you'd say, okay, here's a station, it's established, let's put something allow some denser development there. Where would you do that? You'd probably do it where there were roads with several lanes and a tram and a train and a bus and bus services. And what happens if you do that? You then find yourself looking down Anzac Highway. There's the broad highway itself. There are frequent bus services, and it's uh, right alongside the Glenelg tram. And if you look at the old Holdfast train line, now a linear park, <clears throat> there's room for further service there and one out to the airport. That's the sort of place you do it. You'd, or you'd look along the train lines, and you'd look at the stations, and you'd say, where along these could we put more people if we had to? How are they working out? I, I, I don't, probably don't even need to speak about this. Everybody in this room knows how this transport corridor development uh, free-for-all has been going. You can put up buildings anywhere, and so people are doing them. And the result is not anything that looks like a plan. It looks like here, there, over there, someplace else. <clears throat> and there has been a growing community backlash. A lot of you are probably here because you share that. So, what do we do? Even if there's no growth or we shrink, it makes sense in this plan <clears throat> to look at our least appreciated legacy, the historic rail network, including the tram lines. It's already there. You don't have to build it. And it would be a brave person who would suggest tearing it up. You all Many of you will know that um, there's good reasons to think that the line to Mount Barker might still work. But we could go beyond that. Imagine a rail service that ran along existing lines but extended to reach Aldinga, i.e. McLaren Vale, and Tanunda in the Barossa. Think the plan asks you to to think about how good that would be. It's not enough to designate the corridors or the stations. There has to be very ready access to very large blocks where higher densities could be achieved in 30 to 100 years. So if you get out your Google Earth and look at metropolitan area, these industrial areas along the train lines really stand out. Historically, rail served both passengers and industry. The main purpose, though, of the North-South Line was originally industrial. Now, we have a deindustrialized landscape. If you're out on your bicycle or riding the rails, you will see these sites derelict and unused along the way. To Renewal SA, which is basically a land sales department, um, they, they look like things to sell off as quickly as you can. But if you were really planning for a future, you would say, let the community through its government decide how best to use those deindustrialized zones uh, and those lands and things like the RAF base at Edinburgh Rail has more potential than any other form of public transport, especially as high-speed rail demonstrates improved performances in other countries. We just have let it go. So a serious plan for high growth would require the government to hold large tracts of these lands and the, the red blobs that I put on this map show where they are. The other thing people have been exercised about is what about existing suburbs? The uh, John Rao plans for future Adelaide, 
said, well, protect our valuable suburban lifestyle by having high density development along the train, uh, the transport corridors. That, that's the idea you can read in the 30 year plans. But um, the measures promised to protect those suburbs haven't happened and that's where heritage come in, comes in as well. Um, the National Trust has been exercised more and more by the attack on established heritage suburbs like you find in St. Peter's, Norwood, Paynham, Kensington, um, um, Theberton, Highmarsh, Alberton. Part two of the plan focuses on the steps we need to take to reach these goals. Um, there's much more said about these things in the plan itself. We, we need to secure the existing Adelaide Park lands for good and do a better job of, with our city squares. We need to get back to acquiring the land required to make a national park across the hills face, connecting from Selix Beach to Galva. We need to work on the water courses as linear parks and wetlands and the other things that can be done. You can see some brilliant examples around even now. We need to realize the potential of our legacy of rail. We need to secure our priceless heritage of pre-World War buildings by real protection. And we have to sure, ensure that if population growth does require higher residential den densities, they don't damage our way of life by intruding into the wrong places. And underpinning all of this really would be restoring the community voice to the planning process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.